Okay, so, so welcome everybody. I will talk today about some showcases uh, of Julian oceanography. So uh, we'll, I will talk about different topics. Uh, we will talk about a uh, little bit of numerical modeling, data analysis and machine learning. So these are the three main topics of, uh, of my talk. And uh, so concerning numerical modeling, most of uh, numerical models today are still written in Fortran. But I would like to argue that Fortran and Julian share many, uh, many uh, similarities in the sense that they have been made by the same, um, the same motivation. And Fortran is, yeah, Fortran comes from formula translation. So it, uh, the main objective was to translate formulas into code. And what I, what I find quite interesting, for instance, in the, one of the original Fortran papers, they give you a, some snippet of Fortran code to call it the root of uh, the second degree polynomia. And I think it's very surprising that this is almost all already valid Julia code. Yeah? So they always thought about having the function just defined in one single line. They also think about, uh, uh, defining types of functions not so yeah it's uh, getting your way and so so it's almost valid Julia code except for the for the exponents exponentiation with the half but it works very for different reasons right so in Fortran it works because a b c so they are implicitly declared as a single position so it is not as advanced as Julia where you have type propagation okay and it will all, only work with uh, with floats, uh, with single precision floats. But now we know that the implicit declaration was, an, was maybe a neat idea at the time, but as a uh, source of large problems later on. Okay. So what I did here is uh, a very simple showcase uh, of uh, solving the, uh, the uh, two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation, as you see here, and we simulate the, the flow of uh, around an island. So here you can see uh, what you see here. The structure is called the, uh, um, the Kármán, um, uh, the von Kármán Street, the von Kármán, and so that there are a certain numbers of, uh, of eddies which are generated in the wake of, a, of, a, of an obstacle. And and so. Initially, I made this simulation with, uh, with PyPlot, but I then found out that Mark is much faster and it allows you to do some interactive stuff like, uh, like moving the, the, the target around. And, um, and so what I find remarkable about this to solve the Navier-Stokes equation in this simple case, exactly, essentially just takes about a hundred line lines of code. It's really compact. And uh, when you do the same thing in, uh, uh, in Fortran, Fortran is not much longer, we have all the type declaration, but you can also write it similarly compact, but it's, yeah, it's a bit longer, um, but uh, the Julia code is actually quite competitive to the, to the Fortran code. So it's all explicit loops without bound checks. And, uh, um, and so the Julia code is actually, uh, uh, even a bit, uh, even a bit faster than Fortran. Okay, here I use the G Fortran compiler, so other compiler might have different uh, runtimes. But it's really the take-up messages for numerical modeling, where you have some high when you want to have some high-performance uh, code. Yeah, Julia is really quite competitive, and even better than, than Fortran, in my opinion. And uh, but you, Julia really shines on the flexibility. Okay. So this code was written just for two dimension, two spatial dimension. But what you can do also in Julia quite nicely is you can generalize your code in arbitrarily high number of dimensions. So I don't know if you have ever seen a 3D high dynamical code. You see a lot of code with this copy pasted. Okay, that is my momentum equation, the X direction. This is my momentum equation, the Y direction. So you have a lot of repetitive codes in, in these uh, this models. And uh, in Julia, Using uh, uh, yeah, using Cartesian index and uh, and sometimes macros, you can all avoid this uh, this repetitive code. So 
going from a two-dimensional uh, dynamical model to an n-dimensional, can, n can be two, three, or whatever, um, it actually is not much, uh, much, um, um, much longer. And you don't sacrifice performance. That's also, so it's the runtimes essentially the same. So even if it's very generic, you don't sacrifice uh, the performance. Okay, this is just a, a simple showcase. Uh, so, but if you're really into ocean models, so maybe you should have looked, you should look maybe in these, to these packages I'm aware of like uh, Oceanidans from the Klima project as Gail also mentioned today. And we have also seen uh, Milan this morning talking about uh, shallow waters. And there's also IBEX uh, for biogeochemistry. Uh, biogeochemistry modeling. Okay. So for the other part that I want to touch is about uh, uh, data analysis. So of course, um, um, the very first thing that you need to do is first to have the data in, imported into, you, into your Julia session. And uh, I believe for ocean data, um, the problem is that the typical ocean data is really heterogeneous. So there are we have a large suite of uh, uh, instruments in situ or remote sensing, and they have all different characteristics. So the, the data in the ocean is really heterogeneous. So we have point clouds, uh, rasters, and so on. And we have to have also flexible metadata format to, uh, to capture all this diversity. And so for this reason, I think NetCDF is quite well posed to, to, uh, to tackle this. So. It comes uh, mostly from the modeling community, I would say, but it uh, has been by now also widely adopted for uh, remote sensing and in situ observations. But we have to remember that NetCDev is just a container format. So it means that uh, uh, how the NetCDev is structured, that's another question. And therefore we have CCF, CF conventions. Uh, and uh, and so, um, yeah, most of the data is currently uh, distributed in NetCDF, luckily, and there's some, some push, I would say, there's also some push towards using NetCDF. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, also some other formats gain attraction like ZAR, for instance, which are very interesting as well. But uh, the NetCDF library can by now also read the ZAR data. So NetCDF has become kind of, the uh, NetCDF library has become kind of multi-format packages where you can read uh, uh, proper NetCDF files, you can read data from opened up server, but also you can read uh, ZAR files within the NetCDF and even the old CF files. But there are different packages we are to, uh, uh, to read this data. I think the first uh, uh, packages is the one from, um, um, is uh, NetCDF GL. And uh, it's it used directly the C library, and my uh, NC data sets also uses the C library. And then there have been several packages which have been built on top of these uh, packages, like uh, the Rasters GL that we have heard today from Raphael, uh, which uses NC data sets in the background, or Yaxa Way from uh, Felix, and, uh, which uses an NCDF GL. And there's also a th uh, another package that I recently came aware of, which called NetCDF. I think it's quite interesting to see uh, uh, this, uh, this, all the libraries which depend on NetCDF. So uh, the C library is in Julia is called NetCDF GL and hyphen GLL for Julia link library. So that's the, the C bindings of the library. And um, and so any other libraries which depends, which needs to load NetCDF files, either depends directly or indirectly from this, uh, uh, from this library. So if you want to have a high re higher resolution version of this graph, you can just click on this, this link. It will download an SVG file where you can zoom, where you can see more easily the, the packages. So just to orient yourself, what is in green here, that's the C library for NetCDF GL. And all the uh, other packages which depend on it are, are linked with a green arrow. That's the NetCDF uh, library from Julia Geo, and that's the NC datasets library um, for, for reading NetCDF files. So you can see this, this quite uh, interesting graph of how the different packages depend on each other. 
And what I find also interesting is that actually uh, some packages uh, depend on both. And so there's actually no problem to require both packages, actually, because we, under the hood, we're all using the same NetCDFC library that there will be not a problem to actually uh, um, use, um, um, I use both. And this is also something that I like a lot in the Julia community. This is this kind of standardization that we decided uh, that all C extensions yeah, has to go to a, to a, a special uh, uh, repository, which is called ActRaiser, uh, but that's not important, but we have to stand, we have standardized on all, uh, um, that all the C libraries, uh, that we all use the same C libraries. Okay? And, and this is the main reason that in Python we have pip and conda, I think. So, uh, in pip, this is not standardized, and in conda, they actually try to say, okay, now uh, we have to use all the same libraries, the C, same C libraries, otherwise our package won't work uh, together well. Yeah. And so now I will talk a bit about the different tools that we have developed to work with uh, um, uh, ocean observations. So one of the tool, uh, one of maybe maybe the the first tool that we developed and are still our main tool, it's called uh, Diva, which stands for Data Interpolating Version Analysis. So essentially a, a spline interpolation of in situ data. So you have uh, um, um, you have some some uh, some measurements, and you want to uh, say here you have some measurement of the ocean. And you want to interpolate it and have a, a, a gridded field out of it. And there are some parameters that you can choose. Essentially, you can choose a correlation length, which tells you how far away you want to propagate information. And you can choose also the uh, accuracy of the observations. And this was uh, actually, uh, I had a, a workshop uh, in November last year uh, in, in, in Chile where where we, uh, we teach some, some students how to use Julia and this, this package to create some, uh, some analysis. And yeah, we, we make a kind of challenge out of it. Uh, the idea was that the students need to, to choose the optimal placement of, uh, of, some, uh, uh, of some observations in order to get the most accurate field out of it. So, should you have any questions, uh, really don't hesitate to, to just raise your hands. You don't have to wait to the end. But, uh, I'm just wondering who has heard about Diva before? Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the original tool was uh, written in Fortran, and, uh, and now we have translated to, to, to Julia. And the nice thing again is that the Fortran code was just limited to two dimension. And by, uh, by translating to Julia, it gave us a flexibility to enhance it also to, uh, to multiple dimensions. That's why we call it Diva ND, because it can uh, work in, high, in higher dimensions. And so essentially what Diva does is to try to find a field, a field phi, which is as close as possible to the observations, DJ. And, uh, but at the same time, this has also to have uh, small gradients. Small grades. You don't want to have. Uh, you want to typically have a smooth field, and that's our, our, um, the second constraint that we. Okay. Another problem that you often have with, let's say, traditional interpolation uh, approaches is that uh, if you have the salinity, which is very different from one, like here, the uh, uh, Pacific, and from the Caribbean. You can easily have some uh, some uh, some values from the Pacific that leak through any any uh, island or or physical barrier that should be present in the system. So by uh, by using the spline interpolation technique, you essentially um, uh, you can. It's very natural to to uh, to take these boundaries into account. Actually, it would be even difficult to to not to, to take into account. So you can easily decouple decouple domains uh, and easily. And another thing is by using uh, Julia, it became very easy to add additional constraints. Okay, and they can become necessary when you have, for instance, 
when you're not just looking to uh, to uh, to scalar quantities like temperature salinity when you look to observation of currents you know that the uh, the zonal meridian east west north south component of currents are not independent from each other so they are linked dynamically and this has become very easy to uh, to incorporate by using uh, by using tuning. So essentially, you know that, okay, it takes a lot of energy in the ocean to move water from the beneath to the surface. So the currents are mostly divergence equal, not exactly, but the divergence relatively quite slow, quite small in the, in the ocean. And so if you have a, a velocity measurement and you want to create a, a gridded field from it, your gridded field should also have a low divergence. And here, this is some. Uh, if you if you if you want, this is uh, this is uh, on this link tinyul slash dimorada. It's a uh, it's uh, uh, there is a Pluto notebook uh, running on Binder, so it takes uh, about two to ten minutes to start, where you can just play around about how how it works. So I have it open as well. So typically when you have, so in red is the, uh, is a hypothetical measurement, okay? So when you know at this location, the current is flowing in this direction and you want to, to see, okay, how is the current flowing in my domain? And should you have a closed domain? Then you know that the, the currents, the flow has to go somewhere, okay? So, uh, and by using this divergent constraint, you can actually see you, you would naturally have this, uh, this uh, recirculation. So if you, if you ignore the divergent constraint, you would see, okay, it would just flow in the same direction that you have some your measurement, but uh, then you will have the problem that, okay, you're not, uh, uh, the, the water has to flow somewhere. Yes, for sure. This is an analytic solution. Uh, no, that's actually the solution from Diva using the constraints, but as a synthetic case, um, so this is actually computed on the fly uh, by using the um, uh, by using the Diva tool. So it's minimizing the cost function, saying you have to be close to this point, you have to be smooth spatially, but at the same time your diversion has to be uh, small, and then you get this this solution. Mm -hmm. And I think this is uh, even though it's a very synthetic case. You can show even if you have multiple observations, your, uh, your final solution will be just a linear combination of all these uh, this kind of structure functions. Okay, let's continue. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I saw comparison of Julia Portman. I would like to ask in terms of modeling the comparison between Julia and Compson multiphysics. If you uh, if you have already tried working with Compson multiphysics, uh, no, I I did not. I heard about Compson, but I did not try. I, I did not use it, so I, I cannot tell you how uh, how the uh, uh, I did, I cannot tell you about this. Sorry, <laughs> that's a good question. But uh, yeah, in the ocean we are. We are mostly just having uh, just having water, <laughs> and so um, and I'm not working at this scale where you would need to to interact with the atmosphere and having uh, an air component and droplets and things like this. So unfortunately, I cannot uh, experiment this. <laughs> but it would be really a high benchmark to reach to have something uh, a multiphysics model in Julia. Okay, so um, in the last part of my talk, I will talk about uh, uh, machine learning approach. So one of the, one of the issues with, uh, with Diva is that you have to know quite well a priori what your, your, your result should look like. You should know it's typically, you should know the dominant length scales, you should know the correlation scale, you should know how 
accurate the observations are, you should know how strongly you should enforce the divergence constraint for velocities, for instance. So every time you add a new constraint, you add essentially a parameter, which, uh, which um, depends on how strongly you want this, this constraint to be satisfied. And so, and so we would try to, um, uh, another approach would be to, uh, to use uh, machine learning techniques in order to estimate, um, uh, estimate a full feed from, uh, from uh, sparse observation. So neural networks, uh, so what we use here is, uh, is a neural network and uh, they typically require a lot of observation. So that's uh, maybe one of the, one of the reasons that yeah, there are different machine learning techniques and, and neural networks are those who typically require the most data. And for this reason, we looked here at satellite data where for obvious reason, you have much more satellite data than, than that you have in situ observation. But in satellite data, obviously you have clouds, okay? And uh, you don't have really complete fields either. And actually the big problem with satellite observation so is, uh, um, well, typically what you would do in, uh, when you train a neural network, you would have a, a, a set of training images with cloud and then the corresponding image without. Okay. And then the neural network would just do the mapping image with cloud should map to this image without cloud. Okay. So you would have a lot of pairs with cloud and without cloud. So typically you would take a clear image, add clouds to self and then let it reconstruct. Okay. So that's the basic idea where, uh, where such techniques are I implemented and the technical term is called in painting in, in, in part of the names. But the problem with, uh, um, with, uh, with ocean satellite data is that you have so many clouds. So at any moment of time on the surface earth, there's 70% of the ocean waters which are obscured by clouds. So you cannot really, um, so you would have really, really few uh, really cloud free things uh, if you would go this road. So the, the main idea here was for us to, uh, to let's, like, let's try to start with a method which can deal with missing data from the start. So we have an image with clouds, we add even more clouds to it and try to reconstruct the image uh, with no clouds. And, and so, um, don't worry too much about the details here, but we actually took, we steal the, uh, the idea from, uh, from data simulation from, from the BIOS rule, how to work with missing data. So typically when you assimilate observations in the models, when you try to correct the model with some observations, you don't, not, you don't need to have observations everywhere. And so essentially we, we took the same approach also here. And in the end, you can show when you have when you want to combine different information, different information which all each has is a certain uncertainty, you can show that you have to combine them. And if, if the errors are Gaussian distributed, you have to combine them by dividing them by the inverse of the error volume. Okay. So, and in this way, so this is kind of a rescaling approach. And this, uh, if something is missing, we just say the error is infinitely large. And if you divide by something really large, you would just end up, end up with a zero, okay? But this is really a true zero. It's not a zero that, that, that marks, wait, uh, here is something missing. No, it really re represents the fact that we don't know uh, anything about this. Okay. And so this is the general structure of the neural network that we have. So I should say, initially we implemented this in, in Python, but by now we have luckily, uh, succeeded to, con to, uh, to, uh, uh, to translate it to, to, to Julia. So what you have as the input is your input satellite images. Here is sea surface temperature, SST, and also the expected error variance of the sea surface temperature. So, but think of it, it's a given value where you have data and it's just infinitely large if you don't have data. And since we're working with the inverse of these quantities, they're just uh, mapped to zero. And uh, the structure is here is called an autoencoder. 
but it's actually very similar to a principal component on this or EOF. Just who, who of you has already worked with EOFs or principal component analysis? Okay, okay, yeah, some of you. So the basic idea is with this approach, you compress information uh, linearly, yeah, and uh, and you can show that the UF decomposition is the optimal linear uh, compression of your data that you can still recover most of your initial data. So it's a lossy compression. So you take a complete uh, image, for instance, and you compress it down to say just 10 numbers, 20 numbers. But these 20 numbers are really carefully chosen that you can reconstruct most of the image back. So that's the basic idea of, uh, of the UF decomposition. And what the autoencoder does is really, really similar. So you take a full image and then you are you're doing some convolution operation, downsampling operation, and then you compress the, the, uh, the, uh, the image in the, in the small subspace that you capture really the essence of the image. And from this compressed representation, you can get back to the full image. Okay. But the, um, the main advantage of neural networks here is that they can also capture nonlinear relationships. So we know EOFs or P PCAs are optimal for the linear case, but for nonlinear case, we don't actually know. And, uh, and, and, uh, and outer encoder can actually work with also, we can also represent nonlinear information. And since this is a neural network, it's very easy to add additional features, additional input data to the neural network. So you can also specify longitude, latitude, and the position of every grid cell so that the neural network can learn, okay, in this location, the temperature, even if I don't have any data, the temperature is typically uh, uh, high or low. Okay. And another thing which is quite, quite important, in my opinion, is that uh, the neural network is not only asked to tell what is the temperature at a given location, it should also tell us how confident it is in its uh, temperature reconstruction. And I think this is something really, really important because sometimes the, uh, the uh, cloud coverage are really large. So you, are, you would need to interpolate over a large, uh, large seam. And if you, are, if, you are, uh, have any, if you are unlucky, then probably also the image before and the image after is clouded as well. So you have to ask, the neural network should be able to also uh, tell us how confident it is in the analysis. And so mathematically, this boils down to, to a cost function. I won't go to the into the detail, but essentially, since we have two criteria, we want to be as close as possible to, the, to our training data, and we want to have a reliable error. So there are two things that we want to optimize, and we will have to, we have to combine these two criteria into one single criteria to optimize. And you can, you can derive this criteria by just looking at the, uh, um, as a likelihood, it takes a Gaussian distribution and you want to maximize the likelihood of, of your training data. And so this is typically what you get uh, from, from this approach. So this is the uh, original SST on, on panel A. So there's the cis first temperature in, in the uh, part of the Ligurency in the Mediterranean. And you see already uh, there are some clouds in this area. And what we do, we add even more clouds. Okay? So we add even more clouds because we want to know how good our method is. Okay, so these clouds, so only this data that you see on panel B is actually given to the neural network. And we ask it to reconstruct the full uh, temperature. And then what you get is, uh, is panel C, okay? And then we can compare, okay, every time where we had additional clouds, like in this area, uh, like, like here, how well did the neural network uh, reconstruct it? So you can see that the sum of this feature like this uh, area with low temperature was reasonably well uh, recon reconstructed, but some, some details might, might be wrong. Too. And at the same time, you get, we get this error map. And um, this error map tells us essentially, okay, how accurate the observation, how accurate the reconstruction is. So most importantly, the error map depends on the coverage where you have actually data. So the, the uh, uh, dark blue areas have a low, quite low error because we had actually data there. Uh, but not only, it also 
it also reflects that in some areas, the error is, is just larger because the variability is just higher. So and this is actually can be, can be represented also. And the latest thing that we did with this technique was to extend it to unstructured data. Okay? So not all satellite observations are structured, like a CISPR temperature grid where you have uh, um, essentially a raster of data. Some, uh, some observations are actually uh, rather point clouds, like, uh, like, in, uh, like you have in altimetry data. So most, so currently, uh, altimetry data is just a point cloud and you have the data along trucks, okay? And, um, and from these observations, from these trucks, yeah, we try to obtain a full field uh, in, re in return. And this is just a, this, yeah, this is a validation result where you see on the y-axis the original data, on the x-axis the reconstructed data. And you see actually quite good fit between the original data and the reconstructed data. And uh, we also compared to the to, Dino, to uh, Diva, the other technique that uh, they present before. And the, the neural network uh, gave uh, some uh, I gave some improved uh, um, results, but not by too much. So Diva still works quite quite well, actually. But the main uh, advantage, in my opinion, about this approach is that they can give a quite reliable error estimate. So what I see, what I show here on the on the lower graph, is the predicted expected error and the actual expected error. Okay, and ideally everything should line up along the dashed line, so where prediction match uh, the actual error. What we see, so the blue line is actually quite, uh, quite good. Uh, um, so it's actually just a, a, some, uh, some factor, which uh, some constant factor, which uh, uh, is the opposite from the ideal line. Okay. So the method really uh, tells you the interpolated fields, so altimetry at a given location, but also quite reliably can tell you how accurate this, uh, this reconstruction is. Okay. And um, so this was mainly quite dense. I don't know. So some some more fun of pro fun projects is that uh, um, you can actually capture. Um, so Julia works also on a Raspberry Pi, and you can do some fun projects like uh, building your own satellite receiving station. So some of the NOAA satellites actually send their data unencrypted, and you can just uh, uh, get them with a homemade antenna and uh, what's called a um, uh, software-defined radio. So you can hook it up to your computer and actually get the data when the satellite is flying over you. And, uh, and yeah, so I use for this uh, the toolbox, satellite toolbox to, to, uh, to get the when at one moment the satellite will pass over us. And then uh, another package app decoder uh, that I wrote that can, uh, that can help you de decode the image. So, and then you see something uh, quite, quite nice images um, from the data that you can see from the sunlight. Another um, project that we're currently working on is actually to, uh, to get uh, Julia on, on some devices to, uh, to actually build, well, for students, uh, build ocean drifters themselves, and then uh, equip any ocean drifter with a Raspberry Pi and which is connected to the, uh, to the cell phone network. And then just uh, um, query, repeat, query uh, repeatedly its position and send it uh, via SMS uh, its position. And then this works already. For, well, the software works already, the hardware, I don't know. Uh, we still need to do it, but it's, it's quite fun to see when, when uh, Julia Rappel sends you an SMS, so that is, that's uh, quite, Fun, fun moment. Okay. And, um, and so my last slide will be just to draw your attention that we have in May, uh, um, a Liege colloquium on machine learning and data analysis in oceanography. So it's not specific to, to Julia, but I think many of you are uh, working in oceanography. Uh, I think we have also some people working in uh, one keynote presentation from atmospheric sciences. So we, we interpret it loosely. 
Uh, so, uh, so you're more than welcome to, to join. And the abstract submission is open until end of this month. Thank you. That's thank you. All right. Okay. So, um, just a few slides um, to throw up this very nice presentation by Alex um, to highlight. Um, Couple other things um, related to oceanography. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is to acknowledge that uh, in the genesis of this meeting, another one happened a few months ago. And I wanted to show you this amazing group of people that were here. Um, this was organized by Aida, Joan, and Kana, um, the symposium on advances in ocean observations in July. And um, I participated in, in this workshop, which happened here, right? Um, and so a lot of the credit for um, the genesis of this meeting might go to them, in fact. Um, so this was about the sort of um, um, envisioning new types of observation that Alex just discussed also a little bit. So there's the URL here, and I put the, the picture to sort of um, I also Katarina was organizing this meeting already. <laughs> All right, uh, next thing I wanted to, to tell you about is just a little um, advertisement for those two organizations uh, that you see the, uh, the logos uh, of here um, called Julia Ocean and Julia Clement. Uh, they integrate with a lot of the other GitHub organizations that we have uh, talked about, including, including Julia Geo and, and, and others. Um, and um, I wanted to say that generally speaking, these are meant to be, I sort of created those or one of the lead developers of them. Um, and the way that I see them is as very much open-ended um, that they are not tied to a particular group or a particular grant. Uh, I see that as an important factor in kind of projecting in the future. So anybody who is interested in contributing is more, much, very much welcome uh, if you have ideas. Um, First of all, we are always looking for our feedback. Um, so do not hesitate to open an issue to complain. Uh, sometimes people are shy about that, but that's really important for folks who develop software to know what's broken. Uh, so it's been, it's been mentioned before. Um, so that's one thing to, you know, if, if you find these organizations on GitHub, I'm gonna show you them to you in a second. Uh, do not hesitate to say, hey, this doesn't work or it's missing this or how about that? Uh, we are very interested in sharing this. Right, um, and all I'm saying here is probably applicable to the other organizations like Judah Geo that have been mentioned, I'm assuming. Um, we're always looking for our contributors to both existing packages. If you find that some features are missing, you know, there's always uh, the opportunity for you to participate in implementing them. Um, or develop new packages if they are needed, right? Um, bringing packages like, like these and that we have seen into GitHub organization will increase the visibility of them. It's a way of building communities. Um, so it's totally fair to develop things on your own account. I, I do that so also on GitHub. Um, I tend to move things to organizations when I think they're ready to be more inclusive. It's not too messy, essentially. Um, or some things I just keep on my side, but mostly I think it's very useful to put them, your Julia packages inside organizations. Uh, that's how you will find new contributors, for example, or people that will be able to point out that there's something broken uh, because they'll be able to access it. I think a couple of things to keep in mind is it's important to stay modular. Um, so we try to do little pieces that play together rather than huge things. Um, and always have in mind that if you create software, you're going to want to maintain it. Um, so it's good to start small and build test cases that are going to allow you to 
keep all of these things streamlined. Um, and also these organizations have uh, membership. We are, I mean, for those two that I can speak about, uh, Julia Ocean and Julia Clement on the right. Um, we are definitely interested in new members. Even if you're just thinking of um, developing software in the future, you don't have a specific to contribute, you're welcome to ask to be a member. And by and large, uh, I'm always happy to do that. Um, you go back. Um, yeah, I guess I just meant to say that those, I'll put the slide somewhere and they have the links to the two organizations. So Julia Clement and on the left, Julia Ocean. Um, I won't, I don't want to take too much time. So I'm just going to mention to finish this session, um, some of the packages that are inside of Julia Ocean in particular, um, and have to do with data. So as Alex said, uh, we have a lot of different kinds of data in the ocean. And a lot of them are sort of um, custom type of things. Uh, they are not like standard graded data sets. And so often we build um, interfaces or we rely on other people APIs to kind of interrogate relatively small databases. So we're gathering these things as we speak. The list that I have here are a few things that I created myself. As you see, they are fairly recent. Uh, and they include, in general, each one of them uh, will include um, a package um, with its test suite and everything, but also notebooks. So in the case of my packages, if you go down, there's often examples, and in there is where you find the notebooks. OK. Um, I had opened my window here. I will have examples for you in the hands-on part. Um, so I just went back to this part. Um, so this is my own GitHub, GitHub account. Um, you'll find the organizations that I was referring to here. Julia Clamet, briefly speaking, if you look on the right-hand side here, you will see that, in fact, there's a lot of the folks that are here are already in the organization um, and are in the other ones as well. So it's really this, uh, this sort of social dynamics of GitHub that I'm trying to um, to highlight here and the, the fact that this is all very collaborative. Um, the notebooks folder I've already told you is, is um, the source of the Docker image we're using and it's, it's kind of a central hub as I see it. But here we have a lot of different um, packages from members of this community and, um, and we're looking for more. Um, Julia Ocean, a bit more um, small at this point. Is these three members, Bruno Pesquier, Jean Wu, and myself. And um, there's a list of packages that have to do with um, ocean data, like I said. So in the hands-on part, I will highlight uh, Ocean Robots, which is sort of an interface to a bunch of things like Argo data and Drifter data and, and so on and so forth. Um, Argo data itself, I have a specific package for that because uh, it's such a widely used um, framework, Argo, um, this program, that I think it's really worth having something specific. And then ocean color data um, is something about, um, well, ocean color data. I will just leave it to this and uh, we'll come back uh, later in the hands-on if time permits to show you some examples on the screen. Thank you very much for uh, being here and participating and see you later. Do you have any questions maybe for Gael or for, for us? What is the framework that you're using for the neural network? I mean, you mentioned that now you have it in Julia. So 
just wanted to know. And yeah, that's an excellent question. So um, I started, uh, I tried both Knet and Flux. Okay, but uh, when I started, uh, Knet was uh, ahead, ahead of Flux, and they were missing in Flux. So I, I used Knet, and uh, um, but I have a, a branch which also works with Flux. So I'm considering moving to Flux, and so it's it's uh, it already works with Flux, but it's slightly slower <laughs> than Knet. But I see, uh, yeah, the community is really railing behind uh, behind Flux. So. Um, so maybe I should really make the transition and just uh, just use Flux. But but Knet is one of these packages. It's uh, it's it's made by one really really dedicated person, and uh, he made a really good package. So it's even code that I wrote for some initial Knet code that I worked three years ago or five of uh, three years ago still run, still runs. So it, it takes a lot of the Kena develop take a lot of care to not break your your code and it's really really stable but yeah <laughs> okay so um so now the web page where uh, you want to go to is is this one here so it's a user ul shortener it's a tinyurl.com/ Julia EO21, and we are hands on session 21, uh, hyphen code. So this is, uh, this is the web page where I all want you to go. And this contains all more information about, uh, about this. Okay. So tinyurl.com slash Julia EO21 hyphen code. And uh, I really don't want to lose any of you. So if you want to follow, uh, please, please, please let me know if something uh, is unclear. So I don't want to lose anybody. So if something is not clear, please raise your hand immediately because I think it's... I think you mistyped it. <laughs> uh, so let's check. It's maybe yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah. I was just saying, I got a warning. I think it's safe to click and, and proceed, right? No, 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 no. You, you, you probably, I think you missed it. Okay, mistake. Okay, mistake. Yeah, try. <laughs> maybe you put URLs, sign URLs, or something like this. So. So just, just um, who of you uh, was able to get to the GitHub page? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, great. And some, some of you have maybe some issues? Okay. Does it work for you now? There is no manual software. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So this is, so everything you need to know is here or linked from here, okay? Ah, so yeah, we can skip it uh, directly to the workshop material. So if you have it, um, you should already have it on your USB stick, right? So the USB stick that I passed around should contain everything everything you, you need to, to run the notebooks. Do some of you uh, forgot to copy it or did not get the USB stick for some reason? Okay, so everybody has the, has the data. Ah, oh, and the USB is this there. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so the next thing, uh, so it's to remember where you put the stuff, okay? So uh, try to navigate to your file manager and find, find the uh, Julia Earth Observation Workshop folder. Either it might be with Docker or without Docker. So I gave you two options. You can use this with Docker or without Docker, yeah? But uh, uh, yeah, you should, uh, you should files, find like files 
zero one D by D data preparation, for instance. Okay. So uh, every found everybody found this file. If not, raise your hands. Both the Giga file and the Python notebook are the same way. Yeah. Can I, can I use the same Docker image as before or do I need your specific image? Uh, please, uh, it's better to use my Docker image because everything is already pre-installed. Okay. If you use another Docker image, then everything uh, it should theoretically work, but a lot of things need to be installed. And then you might be better off to just use uh, uh, Julia without, without Docker if you, uh, if you need to install the package anyway. So. Okay. Okay. okay, so I think uh, those who want to use Docker, I would assume that you have already Docker installed, right? And so the next thing is to open a terminal, okay? And so in Windows, actually, there are two kinds of terminals, the old one and the new one. You should use the new one, which is called PowerShell terminal, okay? So you open a PowerShell terminal, yeah. And, uh, and the first command that you need to execute if you use Docker is this one. So if you on Mac, it's just a regular terminal. On Linux, it's a regular terminal. And so this command imports the, uh, uh, the image. Okay. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Yeah. And this will, will probably take a while. And so if, if anybody wants to do it later on, or uh, uh, you can, another option is to download it on the fly. Okay, but we don't do it here because uh, we want to, we do not want to overload the internet. Okay. But this will take a while, I guess. To, to import it. So just in case you already uh, work, it already worked, you can actually follow the readme. I will, if you want to go ahead, you can already do it, but uh, I will, uh, um, um, I will wait a bit to be sure that everybody got the Docker image loaded, okay? So if you're not using Docker, actually, you can already do what's written here, installation directly with Julia Package Manager, okay? That's the alternative that you can, you're not forced to use Docker. You can also use it directly with Julia's Package Manager, okay? But if you're using uh, Linux, you have to be aware that it's one package that you need to be installed. In addition, okay, the uh, matplotlib package from Python. Okay. Is anyone else having compatibility problems? Let me see. What kind of problems? <laughs> So you So yeah, apparently KX doesn't work in the month, so I could not uh, uh, yeah. install it. So how many M1 users do you have? We have other uh, on Mac M1? Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe with Rosetta? 
You can, you can, uh, but you then you would need to re reinstall. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So just, just to know uh, who of you already managed to do this to Docker load to the GSR. Okay. And who, uh, so I know one case, but who is struggling? Who has some, some problems? Okay, so we can go continue. Okay. And um, okay, so you already probably are in the folder containing the Docker image, yeah, right? Because you just loaded uh, the file Julia GFR. Okay, so the next step is to execute the Docker image. Okay, that's the same as before. You type Docker run and specify the port, the web port that you want to publish. By default, is 8,888. And, uh, and the V is for volume. So our current working directory, PVD, print working directory, it's available inside the Docker image under the path home, Jove, and data. And that's the Docker image that we are running. Okay. And when this works well, it will put it will print on, on a terminal a bunch of lines. Okay. So it will start environment, print a lot of line. And what you have to look after is a line like this. Okay. It's say uh, to access the server open, don't do this, don't do don't do this. Neither this it doesn't work for me either. Only the last option actually uh, works and allows you to, uh, to open um, a web browser with, uh, with Docker inside, with uh, all the software inside, okay? And then you will get the standard JupyterLab interface. So you get you should get something like this. So a little bit show of hands who who managed to have a screen like this. Ah, very good. Who is still uh, waiting something to happen? My finger just got to load again. So now I think the doctor ran away. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So so the first step was to load it. Um, so the easy thing is really to copy and paste the comment because it's really long, it's easy to get it wrong. Anybody else still waiting to get uh, this screen? Anybody else? Okay. Do you need some, some help or just wait? Who of you is using the, uh, the option without Docker? Just to know. Everybody's using Docker or somebody you're using without Docker? And it's still it so far? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Well, so you can you can open the first card. Yeah. You can use the side, so it already takes a bit of time to load. Yeah. yeah. One thing that might happen happen to me. I had another one open, which takes the same block number. So if that's the case, you can turn out the previous one, stop it. You don't need to get it. You just need to stop it, and then you can solve it. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a good good remark. I have this all the time, and uh, or what I do sometimes is to use it a different port, but it's the cleaner is to to shut it down so you have to free yeah. our resources. But if something else important is running on port eight thousand eight hundred eighty eight, you just use a different port, and that that works as well. So the typical error message that you will see is this. If uh, address already uh, in use. So if you see this, raise your hand if you don't know uh, why you get this. Okay. So a little show of hands who is able to. Uh, so within this interface, yeah, we can click on data and open the first uh, notebook. Okay, so it, it is called zero uh, one diva and D data preparation I P and B. So we open the notebook, right? And you will should have a something similar to this. Okay. Is this okay? Still, still up. Uh, yeah, you are have to do it manually. So Okay. Uh, but because I, I don't know if I'm going to go to the 
Um, you know, it's a Okay, so now I know I will start putting so let's see. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I will try to stop it. So, um, the idea of this notebook is that we uh, download some data for the Osiris region and then make a, a first diva analysis, okay? So in the very first cell, we are loading all the packages. And if you're using Docker, it should already, everything should be already previous. Yeah, yeah, for sure, thank you. What about that? Is this good, good? also for the back? So, um, so we're loading Diva, we're loading some other packages that we, that we need to, to have, but everything should be already pre-installed in your uh, in the Docker images. Or if you are yeah. using a Julia package manager, when you instantiate, that's a really important step, everything will be installed as well. And uh, so at first we're defining the bounding box. So the longitude and latitude range, okay? So for the Azores region, this is about the long latitude range. So degree uh, uh, degree west would be a with speed and negative values, okay? And for this simple case, um, we are just getting the data for five years, starting in 1st December, 2010, okay? So date time is a, is a function from the dates module, which creates a daytime object which represent a moment in time. Okay. And actually, um, 
in one of our packages, we, uh, we wrote um, a tool which allows you to download the data from the World Ocean Database. So the World Ocean Database is a quite well-known data source in oceanographic community where you can download the data via, uh, um, via a web page. Okay? So what uh, the FIS Ocean package does is actually to automate this process. So you don't have to go to this web page. So it simulates uh, a user going to this web page and, and fetch for the data. So, but it asks you to provide your email address. So therefore also in, in my script here, you provide, you have to provide your email address. But since this is a quite long process, so it takes about some hours to get the data. So we typically we tell you per email once the data is there. Uh, so I, I automate it. I give you already the subset that we are looking at. But typically what you would need to do if you work for a different domain, you would rerun this, uh, this, kind, of, uh, this kind of search. So it would then download the data from the World Ocean Database. Just in curious, who of you already worked with the World Ocean Database or is familiar with or heard about the World Ocean Database? Okay, so ocean people. <laughs> okay, so it is, uh, yeah, it is quite well, well for in the oceanographic community is quite well established, okay. And, uh, but what we will do is just execute this cell, yeah. It will just download the file, um, all the data, okay. So if you do this, it will just print a message, data file already downloaded, okay. I'm just wondering, uh, everybody got this message data file already downloaded or somebody else got, uh, I'm now loading the data. Just because uh, the data file should be in the same directory. Okay, that's the notebook. And if the data is somewhere else, it will not find the, the data and will download it. So if you are at home with a fast connection, that is not a problem, but uh, but here, yeah, the idea is that you have already the data via USB stick. Okay. So maybe show of hands who, who, um, who is already at this step that uh, the data file was located. Okay. And who is maybe uh, has some, some issues. Okay, so the next thing is then to, uh, to load the data in memory. Okay, actually it's not that large, it's, it's loads it quite fast. And then to have a look at the data. I always like to look to the data uh, together with the bathymetry, at least for the coastline. Therefore, I also load the GEPCO, a part of the GEPCO bathymetry. So the bathymetry should be there as well. And then we make a, a first plot of the of the uh, uh, of the data. Okay. So what we do here, actually, we uh, we're looking just at the data which is near the surface, uh, less than five meters. So up steps is the depth of the uh, um, um, observations. And so for now, we're looking any months, the months one to twelve. But you could you could easily narrow it down and to just have say January. Data distribution generally, yeah, it's much less. Okay. Um, and so you can easily narrow the distribution. And so this is the Azores region to recognize here the Azores Island. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for the plots, I still mostly use uh, PyPlot. Um, and here, that's a, a handy way in PyPlot to get the aspect ratio more or less correct, okay? You, you don't want to have plots where, uh, you, you don't want to have the landmass stretched out in an unrealistic way in X and Y direction. So you essentially look here, BY is the latitude. So you're taking the mean of the latitude and then set it to the inverse of the cosinus of the latitude so that uh, the data looks more or less correct. The aspect ratio looks more or less correct. So it's a very easy way to make a, a map projection. 
Okay. And the next step is, is to look, for instance, to the distribution over time, okay? Uh, so in C2 data is, uh, is not only very inhomogeneous distributed in space, but also very inhomogeneous distributed in time. Because a lot of new, the Argo network that already uh, Gail mentioned was really quite kind of revolution for ocean data because the, uh, the amount of data that we have really increased tremendously thanks to the Argo data. But here we are in the phase after the Argo data, um, I think it was 2008 where we have uh, Argo was launched, but still we see here the number of data still increased quite a lot. But if you would extend it before 2008, it would be really, really uh, uh, even, even more, okay? So typically when you do a climatology, you have to take uh, things like this into account. You have to take into account uh, the, the change of data distribution over time, but also the change of, uh, of um, if there are any, any significant change in, your, in the system that you're looking at. Okay. This is the first, first notebook about the data preparation. So we have downloaded the data and uh, made some really first uh, checks, checking the data, the horizontal distribution and the temporal distribution. I'm just uh, wondering. Uh, so, did anybody has some had some issue about this? So, or it worked for? So maybe just raise your hands if you're not were not uh, able to do the last plot. <laughs> so I don't want to lose anybody, as I said. So maybe uh, just tell me if there's something working. <laughs> Okay. Um, just go on. <laughs> uh, okay. Can you open this? Um, uh, yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This this was the for the package, if you use the package manager, this was an initial step. Yeah. But since all the package are not installed for the full, you have to uh, install it. Okay. And also the recommend this? Yeah. Yeah, normally, yes. No, that's, uh, that's not necessary. So that's, uh, you can really delete this because the bit is very integrated. So it's that's legally needed. I need to do that yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. It takes it takes some time for instance to be found. But you have to do this only So it's instance, so uh, along with the notebook, so the list of all packages is installed. That's your the package tomorrow and manager strong files and two files tells you what's needed to instance to install the Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's, that's the TDD Yeah, yeah, 
So now the next thing is actually to, once we have prepared the data, let's head over to the next notebook. Okay, so we have open notebook one, and now let's open the notebook two. So the 0 to D by D examples analyze, D by D example analyzes a source. Yeah. And we'll do it from here. Um, Probably shouldn't. So you should have the second notebook, which should look like more or less like this. And where we actually will do our first uh, diva analysis. Okay. So, as usual, it's quite important to uh, to execute really all the cells. Yeah? And if there is any error, just raise your hand, and we will look look at it together. Yeah. So, very important. Let's open the. Uh, let's uh, import the uh, packages. File is already there because we already, bathymetry is there as well. Now again, reload all the data into memory. And then the first thing to do is actually uh, make just a basic range check of the data. So let's, let's just have a look. What is the typical range of longitude, latitude, depth, and time? And uh, just to see if we don't have any obviously bad data in the in the, um, the data set. So next thing is to uh, then to define the resolution in longitude and latitude. So here we make a, a, a very small test, which just using, well, use a tenth of degree of resolution, but it's actually quite, quite good. But be, uh, take in mind when you increase the resolution, yeah? So essentially if you're, increases the resolution by a factor of two. Uh, your grid cell will be increased by a factor of four. Yeah? But when you um, uh, need to solve the linear system on which D by D is based, your uh, memory consumption will increase by a factor of, uh, of 60, something like this. So four by four, uh, four x to the second power. So, so the memory consumption can, can grow quite quickly if you increase the resolution. Take this in mind, please. Okay. So that's for the horizontal grid and that's for the uh, depth levels. So for simplicity, we're just considering three depth levels so it is, runs uh, uh, faster. And then the most important parameter for DIVA actually is this epsilon two parameters which tells us how large the uh, error of the observations are relative to the error of the first guess. So, um, so this is an eight-dimensional number. Yeah. So it's a ratio of two different errors. So the first guess in Diva would be just the average. Yeah. And uh, this epsilon two tells us how much more accurate observations are uh, than the uh, um, than the um, uh, in the special average. So 0 0.2, it means the observations are five times more accurate than uh, just in special average, for instance. Okay. That's yeah. Um, yeah, this is great. Um, 
I was just wondering whether you also had maybe an option to provide weights separately for the two in kind of... Uh... Yeah, excellent question, excellent question. So a separate weight for different observation, you mean? Uh, for the first guess, say a, a map, and then for the in-situ data, something that might be specially variable also. That's kind of what I was wondering. Um, so a different way to specify the error of the first guess and the error of the observation? Yeah. Actually, this is just the ratio of the two. Mm -hmm. So the diva does not know F, does not need to know the error of the first guess in absolute terms and does not need to know the error of the observation absolute terms. It only needs to know the, know the ratio of both. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so if you write a cost function, you have two terms. It has to be close to the first guess. It has to be close to the observation. If you multiply uh, every of these two terms by five, the, the cost function will still be the same. Minimum of the cost function will still be the same. So therefore we only need to have the ratio of these two terms. I understand. I guess in, the, in my mind, there's a more, slightly more general problem where these errors are heterogeneous especially, uh -huh. for example, because of geophysical noise. Ah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and, and so you want to do something a little bit more detailed, but yeah. maybe that can be added later. Okay. Um, so what you can easily do is uh, spatial variant error of the observations. That's just easy, but it's hard. Uh, and well, it's not possible currently and it's hard to do. A spatial variant of the background. That's it. that's that's me. <laughs> so fine. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Excellent question. Thanks. Um, so the next thing is then to define the correlation length. Okay. And so the correlation length is here defined in meters. And we do everything in meters in, in Julia. And in uh, G by D, um, so this is this is a uh, this is actually the same as written like this, but it's easier to read. There's actually three hundred thousand kilometers. So if you would reduce this parameter, uh, this correlation length, you would actually have uh, more details, but you have also more noise. So it is a kind of a trade-off to make. And so for us. We could also fix a virtual correlation length because we're just looking at three layers. But um, if you're looking at the complete ocean down to, down to, down to its bottom, it's typically you would have a smaller correlation length near the surface, smaller virtual correlation length near the surface, and then higher virtual correlation near the bottom. Okay? That's why it is a bit more complicated here. But don't worry about this too much. Okay? But these are really the two important parameters, the correlation lengths and the epsilon two parameters. Do we have any, any questions about us or some, some, uh, some doubts or some error messages or something which everybody managed to, to go that far? Okay, great. So the next thing is actually uh, to define the time axis. So when you are working with climatologists, there are really different ways to, uh, to approach a problem. So sometimes you want to have a monthly climatology, the average state of January, the average state of February, and so on. Sometimes you want, only want to look at seasons, the average uh, winter uh, um, state, or sometimes you want to have just the average year state, but then for every year, a different student state. And so this is, uh, in order to capture this, this kind of flexibility, we use a variable that we call time selector. Okay, but we, here we use the time selector year list, month list, which means that we are, are making a seasonal climatology. So we're taking all the data from 2010 up to uh, 2015, but we're doing a climatology for every. Yeah. Uh, just a question regarding uh, what are the current methods used for the World Ocean Map based climatology. Ah, and very good question. Be, it's not like Diva, right? It's not Diva. No, it's Diva. Very good question. So, um, <laughs> the, world, I, I, the World Ocean Atlas is based on the World Ocean Database, but the World Ocean Atlas is provided grid climatology. And what they're using, it's, uh, the method is called a successive correction. It's not, it's uh, essentially when you have an observation, you spread it around. Iteratively, okay. 
So it, it's a kind of a simplified form of optimal interpolation. And uh, the advantage is really efficient. Yeah. And uh, you essentially only need to hold your result in memory and the data in memory. So it's not, you don't need to, uh, um, um, yeah, there's no linear system, complex linear system that you need to solve, but it suffers from one of these errors that I mentioned before. So, so, so the leaking through the, uh, to the, uh, uh, so with this method, it's difficult to, uh, or, uh, to, um, to implement this kind of barrier effect. Okay. But the method is called, yeah, it's, it's called the Barnes scheme. Sometimes people claim it's optimal interpolation, but it's actually, when you look to the, to the paper, it's called the Barnes scheme. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's when you have more data, it's better, right? When you don't have so much data, it's less. Actually, I would idea. argue the other way around. If you have a lot of data, it really doesn't matter what you do because you have a lot of data, you will be have an accurate result anyway. But if you have uh, not a lot of data, then it's maybe better to, uh, to, to investigate, okay, uh, what, uh, what would be the optimal choice of, of technique? Because if you have a lot of data, probably all of the methods will be really similar anyway. Okay. So, um, but don't forget to really to execute all cells because it will define variables that we leak later on. And here, one of the steps that we have here is to uh, to. Uh, to define all the metadata that will be in the netcdf file because d by d will directly the output will directly be a netcdf file and you want to have this netcdf file complete concerning the metadata and so there are some yeah uh, here this metadata object is an ordered dictionary where you put all this this data additional metadata but don't worry too much about this uh, this data it's yeah but uh, for other other project or European project is uh, we have standardized on, on what kind of metadata you put in, into it. And the next cell actually takes this metadata and enrich this metadata by contacting a web service in, uh, in the UK, uh, which um, adds some more information about the different variables. So there's uh, the BODC in the UK, which has a, um, a repository of all names of all parameter names with in which code, which parameter code to use, and that's the next step. So if you don't have internet connection, unfortunately, this step will, will fail. But I think uh, it's just a small download. I think it will work for us. Okay. And since running Diva can take sometimes a long time, we want to plot the result as they are generated. So this is the function plot rest. So it plots the result. So uh, we're defining this function and then it will plot for us on one side, the original data, on the other side, the interpolated bit. Okay. This line gives an error? This this one, the next one. I then check your internet connection. No, it's not because uh, the HTTP server are responding that they are all all in the same origin, so they will not respond because they are always uh, making a request from the same position, so they will not respond because it's oh, the same one. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, 
Because every time we do a job for me, we do the No, 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 it would it would change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
you go to sales. Many mm -hmm. people from the same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. 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 <coughs> but if you change the IP address, if you no, change the Wi-Fi, you change the IP address. So it does it should look like you to see that you are the same people. No, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, can you, can you copy the one message yeah. before? So, yeah, uh, just send it to me by email. Can you just save it and then just save it in the text file and send it later? Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. It's really, really a very small file for this to be known. Just to see if it's in the middle of the message. Can you get there? Can you try again? Who else has also this forbidden error when you want to connect to this by executing this? My request not responding. Not responding. Okay. So the, then, um, then you can uh, um, interrupt the counter. You can choose uh, cell. Yeah, you can interrupt the counter. Make sure. Does this uh, this circle is white? It means Julia is not not running anymore. Okay, so if it's running, it will be black. But make sure that's not running anymore. And if it does, if uh, just interrupt doesn't work, you can also say uh, shut shut down. Okay, that's possibly will kill Julia and then re rerun the uh, uh, previous cell. So what we'll try? I hope it's I did not test it, but uh, um, uh, 
which just set for those who have a problem to the metadata to empty, okay? The empty dictionary. Let's see if it works, I don't know. Okay. And then if you do this, you can hit cell run all. Okay. And then we are, we are making the debug analysis. Okay. This is the idea is if you have an error by getting the metadata, you should set the, uh, uh, yeah, you can try to, to set the attributes to, uh, to empty dictionary. Okay. Let me let me see if this works. So I set it to empty. I redefine the plot rest function, and then I start. Oh, okay, no, I'm, I have different notebooks open. Okay. So everybody who has this problem, Got the time to uh, to copy this this line? NC global attrib equal NC var attrib equal dictionary empty. Yeah. So only if you have a if you have an error at this at this stage. Okay. Okay. And so the next step is then to, uh, to actually launch, to run Diva. Yeah. And we'll print out a lot of, a lot of messages, but, uh, but more important in the end, it will also show uh, the analysis and the observations. Okay. So, but we are just plotting for the surface. So you will see the result and the in the in the analysis. Okay. So maybe are you? It works, but I don't know why. It works. <laughs> <laughs> what works when you said why it works is not the empty uh, uh, dictionary. It's not the empty dictionary. Yeah, it just tells you I don't care about metadata. Okay. Uh, I put the metadata to. Yes, why are you doing it? What's the uh, no, the NetCDF will have the data in the NetCDF file, but you don't have the metadata, uh, the author, the six ages. And, uh, it's, the metadata you have to see is uh, who you are, uh, in, which, in which frame of the project this is, and what kind of file it is actually. Uh, okay. Okay. <coughs> Any, um, so any show of hands who has, uh, um, who was not able to, to see this kind of plots? Okay. What about you, did you Okay. So, uh, one, one thing that you can see if you have any suspicious data, any bad data, 
it will strongly impact your analysis. So for instance, here, uh, there are some data points, which is a really low temperature. Actually, the color bar is limited, so you don't see it, uh, but this, this point has really low temperature. And as a result, in the analysis, you will see this kind of uh, really strong anomaly. And yeah, and it's quite likely that this is actually a bad data point. Yeah. So we don't want to have this in, your, in our average. And uh, so even though that here, uh, I only loaded the, uh, the data which were qualified as good in the database, it's unfortunately still often the case that, uh, um, that there are bad data which are undetected in the database. Okay. So in the next step, we actually uh, look uh, Right. Okay, no. Um, okay, let's, okay. Yeah, this, this is a step you don't, you cannot execute twice, unfortunately. Um, So the next step is actually to, uh, to save the uh, residuals, I'll save the observations, and, uh, and we look especially to the residuals. Yeah? So the residual for us, it means the difference between the actual observed value and the analyzed value, okay? And, and so uh, there's a function extrema, which looks at the minimum maximum. If you just directly, Look, the residuals, it will tell you none because uh, there are some nuns in the residual, okay? And typically you would exclude the nuns and then you get, okay. The so residuals is between almost minus 20 to plus 10 degrees. So that's, that's really, really large. So, uh, so by looking at the residuals, it would be a way to exclude the bad data. Yeah? And, um, we can then also, because along with every data, we have also an identifier. So you can look, okay, uh, when, for which observations do we really reach the residual of minus uh, 19 degrees, okay? So that's here, we can then check back, okay, this, uh, this world ocean data profile probably has some, some suspicious data. So that's also good feedback to give. Uh, what are the uh, the data which uh, which probably should be excluded? Okay. So in the next step, we we save the residual. And um, here we can also plot the residual specially. Okay. So here we're just looking at the at the uh, uh, January and near the surface. And we're limiting the color bar to uh, um, minus three and plus three. So if I would remove this, I don't know why. Um, okay. But in Diva, uh, there's also an option to give you the coherence of every observation with other observations around. Okay, that's what we call QC value. 
that's a, a value which helps you to do quality control. Okay, so every time when this QC value is really large, yeah, then you probably have a suspicious data point. Okay, so and when you run this, you see okay, the QC value is almost close to close to zero, except for some of these values where the value is quite large, and this means that yeah, these are data which are incoherent with other data. And the next thing is then to, to decide, okay, I want to discard all the data points which, which have a QC value larger than seven, okay? So I say my good data points are those where the QC, QC value is uh, smaller than seven, okay? You can look at, at the histogram and see, okay, by doing this at seven, only very few points, you will discard only very few points and then it will make your analysis much, uh, much more realistic. Okay. So what we then do for the final analysis, we take all the data points and just take, uh, exclude the bad ones and keep the good ones. Okay. This is in our uh, last step. And then we will do the final analysis when we have just a good, good data points. And you should see a much, much regular field if you do that because you remove the bad data. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, those who have the problems with the metadata, does it solve for all for all of you by setting it to uh, to an empty dictionary? Were you able to to continue? No. Okay, I will show it again. This is this is the line that you have to add if you cannot retrieve the, the metadata. But for those who don't have an hour, you don't need to be So do you know what this is Yes, yes. So no, it's just Ah, okay. This Thank you. 
So you can you can keep for you can keep this notebook running if it's still doing something. Let's uh, let's open the last notebook, which is uh, the third one. So I, I open it from the terminal, but you should be able to open it uh, more con uh, conveniently using the file manager. Okay. So this, uh, this notebook does the, uh, the um, implements the Dinkai technique. Yeah. So that's a neural network to reconstruct missing satellite data. Okay. And so typically this notebooks would require a, a GPU, uh, NVIDIA GPU to, to run on. And uh, so, yeah, I don't have a GPU on my laptop. I don't know if you, but I, would, I would, won't be surprised that most of you uh, um, uh, have, uh, have, have a, a GPU on your laptop. So for this reason, I only explain how the, uh, the data preparation, and then we just download the result and then have a look at the result. Okay, we'll just skip the part where we actually run the neural network. In any way, it's, it takes a long time. <laughs> it takes a long time to run. It takes maybe uh, a couple of hours uh, to, to run. So we won't have time anyway to do it. Okay. And, but, but everything you, you need to, to do, if you would try it on your own data, is actually explained here. Okay. So as before, uh, we're defining a geospatial bounding box for the data that we're interested in. Here again, we look into the Azores region, but uh, later on, if you would try to use a different domain, that's what you would need to change, the longitude range and the latitude range, okay? And we also are loading the data, the start and end time, uh, the time range that we're looking at. So typically here we're looking uh, three years worth of data starting at uh, 2000, uh, 17. Okay. And we're looking, we're using here the MODIS, MODIS uh, satellite data, MODIS is for temperature. Okay. So typically you, you, uh, you would like to have time series as long as possible um, when you're working with, uh, with neural networks. And, and the MODIS is a relatively long time series. That's good. Okay. So um, here we're defining some file names, like the, the, the name of the file is called modis subset. And, um, and we are working in the current directory. So if it's if dots means the current directory, but typically I do my notebooks in one uh, part of the computer and my data files in another part of the computer. So if you, if you use the same approach, your out here would be the part where you put the, the large data files. Okay. And, uh, and here we just download it, download a modi subset if it's not already there. Okay. But you have it already. So it, this, this cell won't do anything. But if you are interested in uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of data, is actually structured along uh, um, a lot of sat satellite data. They are distributed uh, for one file for every day. Yeah? So if you want to have three years of data, you don't want to, to load all the data by hand. Okay, that would be quite a nightmare to do. And uh, so typically you would use um, you would use uh, Julia or any yeah, typically Julia to download all the data. Let's say. And the uh, URLs of these data files actually you can easily they, they follow the same pattern. Yeah. So they have the date in it, the day of year in it, and things like this. So in Julia you then can 
construct the uh, the URL for for a given day, and then you just download the uh, the data. And uh, every, every um, data file actually contains the whole world. Yeah? Um, but we are just interested in the Azores region. So we need to subsample the NetCDF file uh, to the, our region of interest. Okay? And there are different ways to do it. And one recent way that I added in NC data sets is actually to, to take the NetCDF file, or for us, it is a, it is an URL, it is an opened up URL, and then saying, okay, I only want to have the latitude. I only want to have want to have the latitude within this range, and the longitude within uh, within the range that I defined before, yeah, within the bounding box. Okay. This allows you to to subset the uh, uh, netcdf file, and then write it to to the disk. Okay. But for us, uh, the data is already prepared. Huh? Okay, so we're just loading it here. Okay, so everybody should be able to execute this line. It should not really add a lot of. Uh, um, uh, it should not be uh, uh, download anything. Uh, so let's have a look. SST is now an array with about 200 times 160 uh, elements. And we have 100, uh, about 1,000 uh, um, data points. Okay. If you want to plot, let's have a look at the, okay. Uh, So that would be the first time instance, okay? What I did here, so SST is a three-dimensional array. I just extract the first time instance, okay? And in this array, we have actual values yeah? and we have missing values, okay? And uh, in Julia, the uh, missing values is a, is a special type which is called missing. So for instance, the first element Oh, that's actually value, but let's try another one. Uh, it's missing, okay? So, and so that's, that's the way that we are, are working uh, to, to declare missing values. So one of, one of the common questions, why we don't work with nuns, okay, for missing values. So most of MATLAB uses nuns, um, X-Array in Python uses nuns a lot. But the idea here is uh, nuns only work with floating point numbers. Okay? You can have also integer numbers and missing values in those. So you don't, don't want to convert integer values to floating point numbers because you would might you can lose lose position with this. Okay. So that's why that's uh, Julia works with Julia gives you the, the possibility to never to have an array where the different elements can either be floating point numbers or missing values. So L type just tells you the element type of different numbers. Okay. But unfortunately, um, the pyplots package doesn't work quite well with doesn't work with missing values. The just the plots package handles them correctly, but uh, in pyplot, I have to replace them by none. And that's what the no missing function does. Okay. And, uh, and the convention is a bit weird in the sense that the, uh, the first dimension is actually the y-axis and the second dimension is the x-axis per default. Okay? So PyPlots uh, adopted the same convention than MATLAB before where the first dimension is the y-axis and second dimension is the x-axis. So we have to transpose it everything to have it 
uh, something more, uh, yeah, to have the axis in the same, same direction, in a good direction, okay? Just want everybody got to manage the plots or to, to got it at this point. Okay, so now the next thing is to just, as before, to rain check the data. Uh, we want to have the minimum and maximum values so to the two extrema of the variable SST and qual, which is the quality flag, but we want to skip the missing values. That's the skip missing function. Okay. So here actually uh, we can keep uh, no additional quality flux is necessary, quality control is necessary, but in other tests, I need actually to discard some data larger than 40 degrees or with a quality indicator larger than, than, uh, than three, there were, I had to mark them as missing, but actually in this case, uh, none of them is uh, marked as missing in addition. Okay. So once we have, Clean up our data, we'd save it again to a NetCDF file. And, um, and now we need to decide, yeah, in this image, where we do where we have land and where we have ocean. Okay. And the only, only thing that you have is this image with this is I have data and I don't have data. Okay. Obviously, when there is land, you will never have data. Yeah, because you will never have a surface temperature measurement when there is land. So therefore, we're just looking at uh, where we typically have never data, and then we mark it as land. Okay. But also it can be problematic, just uh, a grid cell where you have just one time data and then the, and and uh, just some small bay which got, got flooded just one time, but otherwise it's only masked land. So uh, typically what, what we do is say, okay, if for a grid cell to be considered C, it has to be at least 5% of the time uh, covered by, uh, by the ocean. Okay. And this adds to the NetCDF file, a new variable, which is C is a mask. Okay. Another, another important thing is uh, we have to, um, to, uh, to remove some data from the data set. We have to mark some points as missing, okay? And that's using the step at CV point, which adds cross-validation points to the data, okay? And here in our case, we are adding 10% uh, or rem removing 10% of data. So we adding some kind of synthetic clouds to the, to the, uh, to the data sets, okay? But some of you uh, maybe have an idea. How would you remove some data from the data set? Do you have some ideas? How would you, uh, what would be the approach to remove data from the data set? Hmm? Random? Random? Yeah. Exactly, we did also run the plot. That was the most obvious thing to do. We just said, okay, a random 10%. And, um, and this gave us an error, which is really, really too good. It was too good, the error. Do you have an idea why? So if you just choose randomly 10%, just really random, that's a run function, and just uh, exclude 10% of the data. Exactly, exactly. So. If you do it really randomly, you have isolated pixels that, that were removed. Okay. And we did actually this, and we kept saying, okay, so error is really, really low, but if you just exclude pixels, yeah, it's really easy to reconstruct them because we have all the neighbors, right? Okay. And so, uh, but what you typically have is actually, you have clouds which have a special extent, right? And if your cloud is, uh, uh, Hundred or tens or hundred kilometer in diameter, so it's a large area that's actually not measured. 
And then it gets the problem to reconstruct this data is actually really hard. It's, uh, it gets much harder. Okay? So the idea is that uh, when you remove some data, yeah, using cross validation, you should uh, you should not make the problem too easy. You should actually remove. Um, you should what you add to. Uh, you should add something which really resembles the class. Okay. So the approach that we did here, we took the, uh, the yeah, do you have a question? I was just gonna say that Ito Julia has a big thing like say having a technology with the structured lens oh, and yeah. part point optimization and like <clears throat> clients. So you can choose the kind of company that best matches this question. And then you could just explore like how to cut off that. And what, what is the approach to use the random data? Oh, so there's like 10 different ones. It's like ah, okay. 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 Just love from spatial instead of having Yeah, yeah. That's a very, very common problem. Okay. And uh, yeah, so the approach that is really here is some is uh, is let's take the uh, let's take the clearest image in our uh, in our data set. Yeah. And then choose randomly different data yeah? and just copy the cloud mask from this different data to the very clear image. And then repeat it for the second clearest image. Yeah? I have a clear image, maybe with no cloud or very few clouds, and then get the cloud mask from another image yeah? and then exclude all the data there. Okay? So it is kind of iterative processes where you intentionally degrade the, your clearest images yeah, and then add some clouds there. Okay. And we're starting with the clearest images because if you would take an image where you have uh, um, um, where you have very few data, you don't want to exclude. You want to don't, don't want to cover everything. That would be. Uh, but you want to. Uh, yeah, that's the reason why we take take the clearest images. And that's what the at CV point does. Okay. And so in the end, we exclude about 10% of, uh, of, of validity. So it stops when it reaches your target, uh, your target's number of uh, validation data. Okay. So the next thing is then to actually to, to run our neural network. But this, we, uh, uh, we won't do it here because it will take a really long time, okay? So it checks if CUDA is functional. So um, we're using here neural networks which support CUDA. So this is the, uh, only the NVIDIA, um, only on relatively recent, but no, only the NVIDIA GPUs support the CUDA API. But there is also some work to implement AM, uh, AMD uh, GPUs, but that's not as, as mature, okay? So if CUDA is not available, it uses uh, CPU, but this will be really slow and we don't do it here. But the notebook should, should still run on the CPU, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it will really long, run for a long time and it will not be fun <laughs> to watch do, doing it. Okay, so in the next thing, I uh, define some hyperparameters. So the number of epochs to be run. And so the epoch is actually means how many, uh, so the neural network is trained iteratively. So uh, the data is split into batches of here of 32 images, yeah. And uh, it computes, so the gradient of the cost function using these batches and updates the weight of the neural network. And then it goes to the next batch and so on until it completes, until it went through the whole data set. And this is one epoch. But it repeats it several times. And here we're using a thousand epochs. And another thing that we do, is, uh, which is slightly uh, special, we actually saving the result at different epochs and then taking the average of it. So here, this is uh, how you would run the neural network, but we don't do it here. Instead, we're loading the file, which I uh, already prepared for you. 
And this is, this is the, the loss function. So initially the neural network is really bad because we initialize it randomly, but as you optimize it, the error will go down. You probably can go even, uh, even further than thousand epochs um, to, to drive the error even smaller, okay? So the loss here represents the negative log likelihood. That's a technical term. So it's the, uh, the logarithm of the probability, yeah? of the probability that you're having uh, your observations, assuming that the, uh, um, that the neural network will give the right answer. And you want to uh, optimize this negative log likelihood. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering um, because it's based on features that are identified in the images or the data. Um, kind of how much does it generalize to different regions, depending on whether you take absolute values of SSC, for example, versus anomalies? If it's a concern or not, if you don't cover. Like, a, you know what I mean? If you train in the North Pacific, yeah. can I apply it in the sun? Yeah. So in this case, uh, it would not uh, generalize uh, at all because I use longitude and latitude as an input. Okay. So I tell, I give the neural network, okay, this is the value and these are the coordinates. And if I would use a completely different domain, it will have coordinates it never saw before. So it will be terrible to generalize. Okay. So if this is your uh, objective, uh, you should not probably should not include longitude latitude in the training data set, or you would say, uh, I will need to uh, train it somewhere a bit everywhere in the world. Yeah? So what we did so far, we concentrated on the North Sea we con or we concentrate on the Mediterranean Sea and we use only data of the Mediterranean Sea, but we did not yet check uh, if, uh, if we can, in fact, do a neural network which can be valid uh, everywhere. But it uh, would be nice to see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the cost function. Yeah. And it is, you see a bit of noise in there in the cost function. Do you have some ideas why we have noise? Why it's not just the line going smoothly down? Yeah, exactly, exactly. We, we're not computing the gradient on the full data set. You're only computing the gradient on the subset. Yeah? And the subset is even choosing randomly every time. So that's, that's why uh, the gradient will be every time a bit different and the loss function will also fluctuate a bit. And actually, this is a this actually is a good thing because uh, when you're optimizing neural network, um, you can uh, you can ex escape a local minima by using this uh, this mini batch gradient descent, and that's also the, one of the reasons why it's also some kind, sometimes called stochastic gradient descent because you're randomly choosing a mini batch every time. Okay, so I think I'm almost out of time. So in the, in the last step, we're just plotting the, uh, uh, all the results. So um, if you execute this function, it will plot all, uh, all the results, but only the results where we had some cross validation. So I can, I guess I can still, I will just open this in a five uh, browser. So these are the, the results of the neural network. Huh. Yeah, so. Um, so typically, uh, so in panel A, you see again the original data and B where we added some clouds. And here we uh, excluded um, 13,000 pixels in this image. 
and the neural network only sees what is in final B and then tries to make a, a reconstruction. And something quite interesting when you, when you work to, with this high resolution data set, you, you get the impact of uh, cloud shadows in your, in your reconstruction. And are sometimes data which is, uh, which is really cold. So I'm really not sure if in the original MODIS data, for instance, all these uh, this cold temperatures near the cloud edges are actually really, uh, really uh, realistic values or if these are just mislabeled cloud. Okay. But I, I think I won't, I won't, I will stop here and give uh, Gail the opportunity if you want to, to, uh, to, or, yeah. Okay. Either way, if you want to go in the next notebook, you can. Uh, no, that's all, that's all. So the first notebook will be for tomorrow. <laughs> okay. No, thank you. All right, uh, so I just wanted to show um, a couple notebooks that you will find in the uh, here in the Julia Clement notebooks webpage that have to do with institution data sets um, and how to access them. Um, so I, I run them separately on my laptop because I was already using the Docker image from Alex. Uh, so this should work either way and they should be fairly fast. You'll find them on the Julia Clamet. Um, so github.com slash Julia Clamet and then the notebooks. And very briefly wanted to um, highlight that we have now a few different things. So the World Ocean database is a great one too. In fact, um, ways to interrogate uh, some of the ocean databases out there. Uh, so here is one that I got a bit familiar with recently, uh, which is the Ocean Apps um, platform. Uh, if you're an oceanographer, you're probably seeing these type of things before. Uh, this it used to be called GCOM Apps. Um, it's now called Ocean Apps. And this is a group that is collecting all of the metadata from operations at sea, which includes floats, drifters, and so on, as well as uh, in-situ cruises, um, so ship cruises that are planned or in the past. So it's a good way to kind of prompt, like uh, figure out what's out there, essentially. Right? And they have, they should have just about everything you're interested in. So here, uh, I'm showing Argo, the operational ones uh, are blue points, the planned deployments um, are in red, the drifter data set from the global drifter program are in green, and I have the tropical moored buoy, and you can just change that to uh, a bunch of other things. Here I'm looking for vessels of opportunity uh, data sets, and so on and so forth. So it's, a, it's a nice way to kind of figure out um, I don't know if you're interested in anything. I'm going to do hey glider. Let's see. Um, yeah, we don't see much. There's a little bit there. Um, so it's a good way to sort of explore, sort of through uh, everything else that I'm going to show. And this is just for the metadata. Though. So you then want to go to something else to get the data itself. Um, here is a few in addition to Argo and the Global Drifter program that I have already gone, gone through. Um, so the no uh, the NOAA buoys um, they have a a nice little uh, API that you can interrogate um, mm -hmm. and so you can with this notebook uh, explore pick whichever one you want. These are kind of nice because some of them are very long time series. We've used them in classroom for like um, twelve year olds to make like a little um, kind of climate change demo in math class. Um, Along those lines, here is another one that's um, to the credit of our colleagues in uh, Hawaii and, and Woods Hole. Uh, this is the so-called Woods Mooring, which is a very rich data set, a time series 
There's a lot of dif different variables. Uh, so again, we have like a, now a little, oops, <laughs> a little uh, way to explore it uh, remotely and then, and then subset it. Couple more. Um, well, just one more, the glider data sets, uh, because I mentioned it before. So these are um, sort of slightly more rare uh, data sets, but um, they're very nice because they have uh, very high sampling rates. Um, and so there is a bunch, um, just going to go uh, change that. That didn't work for me. I guess I didn't download that. Uh, there you go. So just, um, and same thing for Argo and the Drifter program, those are things that you use. We have now uh, simple little notebooks um, for you to get the data and, and, and look at it. And, um, and this is all within the oceanrobots.gl package. Um, so that's all that I was going to mention, just to side complement to what you are, you are describing. And if you have other ones that you are interested in building like this, uh, please reach out. Um, I'm hoping to get kind of a, so my comprehensive um, way to approach those heterogeneous data sets that um, have very kind of high sensitive value. Uh, so that's it. Thank you all. And uh, I'll to that.